It's important to talk about gender because it's an internalized system that encourages people to self-regulate. We think of people as gendered people and I mean that also affects how you get treated. The minute you're in a heterosexual relationship, immediately there are male and female roles that are pretty stuck. They're almost inescapable. We're having this conversation because there's, there's a history of, of power, there's a history of an imbalance of power. We're all working now. We all put our hand back and go to work. So things have changed. Part of our work is about getting people to think about the things that they think are not gendered and getting them to recognize those as gendered. What do you say to your kids about boys and girls? about other genders, about men and women. The high rate of sexual violence against women and how many women in South Africa that affects. That is the huge fear that I have as a mother of two daughters. We are in a culture where men get given a high five for really doing the basic bare minimum they should be doing. You know, men are not only perpetrators of violence, but in fact, they are also sort of self-policing and often the way that they respond using violence is because they've been conditioned to suppress or disengage from other ways of sort of coping. My own father, my first hug was in my 20s and that was very awkward. You know, we do handshakes. <laughs> Let's try and like change the way we do things, the way we think. If you say girls can be powerful and they can be powerful, we have to teach complementary education to boys. We know a lot more about how inequality is happening in families but we know far less about how equality is actually happening in families. My name is Rebecca Hellman and I'm a researcher at the University of South Africa's Institute for Social and Health Sciences. The kind of work that I do is how do people learn about gender in a way that makes violence possible. My name is Copano Ratele. I'm a professor at uh, the University of South Africa. I'm also a researcher at the South African Medical Research Council. We spoke to 18 families around how do feminist families, gender egalitarian families, uh, or anti-patriarchal families raise their kids. How they transmit values around masculinities, around femininities, gender relations. We began by interviewing each family about uh, issues of gender equality and getting them to talk to us about how are they thinking about it, how are they practicing it, you know, what are some of the challenges. And then we just went and hung out with them. And I mean, I've, you know, been on dog walks, uh, done bedtime stories, um, you know, hanging out, eating dinner, uh, just to get a real feel for the kind of everyday activities, because that's really where our sort of interests lie. How does what we do every day or what these families are doing every day create a context in which violence becomes impossible? So growing up you learn that uh, women are to play this uh, homemaker role and nurturing role. Cleaning, cooking, looking after children, that's a woman's job. And you know then going out, making uh, money, coming back, uh, being attended to, um, in that sense, is the man's uh, role. The minute you're in a heterosexual relationship, immediately there are male and female roles that are, you know, pretty stuck in terms of who does what and even how we think of ourselves. Heterosexualism does kind of lock us into particular roles and I think that it is very difficult to challenge those. I'm not saying what they did, like in the old days, was taboo and so on, but now we're in a different uh, era, you know. I think we, they said we like we are half and half, so 50-50, so everything must be 50-50. If you're working, I'm not working, one, one must do the other, you know. Even with the children, raising the children, it should be like the same. Because we made, it takes two to tango anyway, it was half and half, we made the child together, so everything should be equal, you know. And even with kids, when you raise them, you must teach them the same way like that. From the start we knew that you know each one of us has different strengths and we tried at first to fit into a particular lens where I did the things which I thought I'm expected to do and vice versa. So did Lusanda. 
But after a while, we realized that it wasn't really working for us. So him and I, we pretty much do what needs to be done to make our home function, even if it acts outside of the box. So he will do things that were traditionally expected to be mine, and I will also do things that would be expected to be him. But this is how we feel like we should help each other, because we're best friends and we're wanting this home to work and our kids to, to also be healthy. I teach my kids as well how to do like, you know, basic house chores and your responsibility. You know, when you come from school, you need to hang your uniform, um, polish your shoes, wash your socks, hang them. If you can't hang them, ask someone else to hang them for you. The same way my mom said, everybody must learn how to do things because you're going to have your own house, you're going to have your own family, you need to have the basics. Yeah, yeah, that's how we were brought up. Yes, we talk about gender a lot, uh, even with my son, he plays with dolls. They would tease him, those would say, ah, you are a Morphe, why are you playing this and this? No, there's nothing wrong with him. If he wants to play with, with girls, he want, if he wants to put on a weave, it's okay, it suits him. If he says, I want you to buy a doll for me, the Barbie doll with high heels, I do that. And people at the shop would say, hey, but why are you buying a, a boy this? I said, ah, he wants to. And I would educate them even at the mall. I'd say, listen here, if I buy this, I'm not buying this because I want him to be a, a, a lesbian or gay or what, but I'm teaching him nurturing. They understand the notion of like sharing the workload. They know, oh, mama's going to be tired. If she's tired, then she's not going to be able to do this. Or we won't be able to do fun things together. So let's work together so that we can bake if we bake, so that we can make pizzas if we can, or wash dishes or, you know, peeling, whatever, you know. Yeah, that's how it is here at home. For us, from the minute our kids were born, it was sharing, you know. Nicole would breastfeed and then hand me a baby to then be burped, you know. But it was definitely from the beginning, like, yeah, we're sharing this. A lot of things that I try and do differently for my kids, put it that way. So I don't hold it against my parents, but I try and keep that in mind of like, oh, I wouldn't do that or I don't want to do that for them. I'll use that in context of my own upbringing. Um, my dad was very much the father, you know, like the, the father figure of the household and, you know, mealtimes weren't about sitting around a table debating things and asking questions, you know. So there was that very dominant patriarchal Oh, I work all day, so therefore I expect this. He never cooked, you know, it was like, came home, there was a meal put in front of him, occasionally he didn't like it, and then he would get upset about the meal. And so I started to question that and said, well, if you don't like it, why don't, well, you, know, why don't you do it yourself? You know, and that wasn't allowed. So and maybe subconsciously I decided to be different and, and, try and get involved and, and actively like learned how to cook maybe subconsciously doing it, not knowing that I you know, was, really didn't want to be like my dad. But now we share everything, you know, from cooking to cleaning to everything, you know, and I'd rather have it that way than, yeah, I think there's, it's changing, but I guess it needs to change in the home first before it changes out there. So I don't know, yeah. It's a struggle and a daily negotiation to understand what raising equal families might look like. So we should always be going back to values and beliefs to challenge those. And sometimes you realize that there's a lot of unlearning that you have to do. Uh, and this journey has been for me about unlearning. The most practical thing, you know, I'm pregnant and I've, I just walked out of theater. And the expectation from the doctors is that you're gonna rest, you're gonna put up your feet. Everyone else in the household can help to support you. You've just had a baby come out of your body. Right. But then my mom, as for instance, was first very worried that my husband was doing this, doing that, bathing the baby and cooking the food. She didn't know what to do with the fact that my tata was comfortable as a parent to this newborn baby to, to be doing his part, which is to support me. They didn't know what to do with themselves and like what's a woman supposed to do in this space if a man is assuming this space. And so those conversations they needed to start because I want my mom in my life and I wanted to celebrate our family and how we're doing things and so I have to approach it with grace and help her to draw it into the picture in a way she won't feel like oh my gosh my child is now now as a baby and now she's turned to this man hating and men oppressing feminist or whatever but for her to lean in and see wow this is actually amazing this is remarkable we, we actually don't see this enough. Families are really important social institutions 
and they are the first place where children are, are exposed to notions of gender. And so disrupting or challenging sort of gender inequality within the family is likely to have you know, very important implications for young people, for children, but also for you know, men and women who are in those kind of situations. This kind of work is important in South Africa because it is clear from the literature that gender equality is connected to two things. It's connected to gender-based violence. So sexual violence is closely associated with unequal relationships. So if you can get it right about the messages, work and programming around gender equality, you are headed some way towards resolving violence. We want better protection for women in this lifetime. Enough is enough. Enough is enough. We are able to talk about certain kinds of violence and we've made great progress, for example, in talking about at least certain kinds of sexual violence against women, for example. And I think this is particularly important in the South African context where we're seeing a woman protesting, trying to bring our attention to how, you know, as a, as a nation, as a society, we are failing to engage with issues of violence and gender equality and we're actually doing a lot of damage, you know, in that failure. It's taking more and more extreme forms of violence to get us to engage with the relationship between gender or gender inequality and violence. That is the huge fear that I have as a mother of two daughters in South Africa, you know, is the high rate of sexual violence against women and how many women in South Africa that affects is an awful fear to have. It's an awful reality to know and be bringing up two girl children. It's um, feels like a betrayal, feels like on some level I have already betrayed them to bring them up in a society in which that is so rife and so likely to happen to them in their lives. There have been cases here in South Africa in particular, high profile cases but also other gruesome, brutal cases of violence. It tells you that patriarchy is alive and well. And patriarchy is simply stated that men rule by nature, by social dictate, by cultural dictates. We recognize certain things as violence very easily. So we recognize rape or certain kinds of rape, usually rape committed by strangers and that kind of thing, as real rape and real violence. And then we recognize things like, in some instances, intimate partner violence that leaves bruises and that kind of thing as violence. And we know that women are disproportionately affected by those kinds of violence. But uh, there is a much bigger invisible problem. Part of what our work is trying to do is to make the connection or to broaden the connection and saying, yes, rape and murder and uh, domestic violence, you know, physical domestic violence are violence. But there's something else happening which is making those kinds of things possible and making them possible at the kind of rate that they are occurring. You have to empower girls, but you have to give complementary education for boys that you, they have to be egalitarian. You, you have to nurture this. You have to talk to them all the time that, of course, girls can do this. You have to make movies that show that girls can do anything boys. They can drive trucks, they can be superheroes, including that, of course, you can marry Joe or Jack. Uh, you're teaching them about sexuality. Because we know that in contexts where things are very unequal in terms of gender, then violence is easily possible because if women are not performing their appropriate role, then it's seen as acceptable for men to reprimand them with violence. But if you have a context in which men and women are seen as equal and they seem to be sort of sharing and they aren't those kind of expectations, then violence is not necessary. So now in situations where women are increasingly working, they have what we call the double burden of care. So they're expected to go to work, perhaps be high paid executives and that kind of thing, but they're still expected to come home and, and cook dinner and that kind of thing, or to outsource that to other women. 
If I talk about my own family, you know, both my parents are very, very successful professionals. They, in fact, work in the same profession. But because of sort of external structural stuff, my father gets paid more and probably will always get paid more. And so that means that when there's someone who has to do the sort of more domestic work, the cooking and that kind of thing, it falls on my stepmother. Even though, you know, we don't have the stereotype sort of of the of the 1940s housewife, for example, we definitely still have a situation where women are uh, are still regarded as responsible and that kind of labour is still really undervalued. Even if the woman is not working, they have been actually doing work. What is called not working is work. And if you have ever spent a day with a child at home, you know, this is a lot of work. This is a lot of work. They, you have to tell them all the time, brush your teeth, do your bed, come. You have to bath them, you have to, if they're a baby, you have to change, you have to feed them, you have to think ahead about what they have to eat. It's a lot of exhausting, not only physical work, emotional work. And I think at a deep level, men know this. They know that housework, care work, is a lot of work. And because they're in power, they check out of it. You have to think very hard about the work that you need to put in raising a kind, generous, happy, egalitarian boy. You can do all of this work in the home and when they step outside of the gate, that the world will check them. The world will undo the work that you have done in the house. So it cannot be one person, it cannot be one family doing this work. To be able to change society, a larger number of, of members of society have to move towards goal. But we have to start it somewhere. The change for me comes, I think, at two levels. I'd like to believe that every generation looks back at the generation before and says, my parents tried their best given the resources and knowledge that they had, and I'm going to take the good out of that, and I'm going to now add uh, the resources and knowledge that are reflected by my times, my contemporaries. And so I hope that we are progressing as society in that way, at least largely. Uh, someone, someone said that the biggest, the biggest sustainers of, of, of oppression towards women is the gatekeepers are actually women because we don't know how else to be and we're trying to pass on a mode of survival to our daughters. And so we, we try to tell them this is how you're going to make it in this world. Sustain this thing, right? This is, this is your ticket. <laughs> if you sustain this beast, you're going to be happy. You're going to have a home. You're going to have provision, da 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 da, da. So then there's, there's that journey where how, you know, we've learned how to walk with our older generation and, and just help them to trust this. I, I think most of the people, they lack, you know, they, they lack the foundation like from the early age at home. And they saw how women were treated even from their boyfriend, like their uncles and so on. Like here at home, it's not acceptable. You cannot shout or swear at a woman. If you are wrong, even if you are my brother, I would definitely say, listen, I'm a woman myself. There is no way that you're going to treat your girlfriend like this. I'm raising two sons here and I'm raising a female, so you must set an example. Teach your children. If you teach them that they can find it's not a woman's responsibility to take the child to the clinic, to change nappies, change them because you made the child yourself. It's not, it's not a work where you go, I've arrived. We know how to do it. But it's one way we're saying we're committed to a process. Oh, you're doing so good. I get to understand uh, some of the things which I think are missed opportunities for fathers in my dad's time. And, and as a child, I feel like I missed out on some of those things. And I don't want my children to miss out on some of those things. And so I purpose to, to change and to do it differently. <laughs> I guess I'd love, I'd love to create a world for them, one where they won't limit themselves based on their gender, one where they know that they can choose, they can exercise their agency, and that their bodies, their voice, their gifts, 
they matter, that there isn't a sense of me having prepared them to just be a wife, to just be a mom, and to normalize them not having dreams of their own. If you're only going to do work with grown-up men and women and other genders, you are missing an important step. The step is about that the work has to start right at family level. So it, because witnessing violence in the family and being treated harshly as a boy or a girl, but also seeing the relationships, if you're a girl, that you are treated as less than to your brother, to your, to your male siblings, that has an impact later on, right? So witnessing violence is related to gender-based violence later later on, and other forms of violence. You know, the everyday gendering of our lives, the things that children are told that they can wear, they can't wear, the, the kind of hobbies that they are and aren't allowed to do, you know, those are all sending very clear messages to them about what is and isn't acceptable behavior for boys and girls. And that's really, you know, deeply entrenched by the time, you know, by the time you're even aware of it, it becomes very difficult then to kind of push back against that. I think this idea of what is a proper legitimate family is really important in thinking about gender equality because I think that they are, and I know that this is something which has come up in, in our work, this idea that if you're a single parent family you're inherently lacking. That's rooted in an understanding that you know men bring certain things to the family that women are incapable of bringing and of course that's about gender inequality. We have one, you know, fantastic, uh, you know, single parent family living in a working class neighborhood that is doing, you know, wonderful work, you know, just mom and daughter, you know, and she doesn't have those, you know, kind of luxuries. But she's made a choice to enact this kind of egalitarian lifestyle and to, to take on kinds of work that are flexible so that she has time to spend with her daughter and to have these kind of important talks and these, this important time. Looks better like better. This is the ultimate goal. In our research, we are trying to contribute to what's changing relationships between men and women and other genders, between different sexes, between boys and girls. This is the ultimate goal. The work that you do at home has to be done at school. You have to do it at varsity. You have to do it in the workplaces so that all parts of the puzzle come together. What we've seen from these families is it's not only about challenging you know, problematic norms about gender, it's also challenging problematic ideas about race. Some families are doing, you know, are doing really interesting work to engage with their kids about you know, ability and disability. It's also about you know, sexuality and gender expression. And so it's about a whole package of equality. Do I have hope that our society is changing? I cannot not have hope. Otherwise, my, my whole life is meaningless. I, I believe it is not just possible uh, that it's happening too slowly, but it's happening. Well, for a long time, we didn't have the data to understand the picture around gender equality in South Africa. Now we have the data that gives you a clear picture about beliefs, attitudes and practices around gender equality in South Africa. The simple fact is gender equality is good for society. That equality around gender but also around race, that this is good for a society. That if we have a more egalitarian society, we will not only have less violence, but we will also have a happier society. A healthier, happier society um, and well-being will be an ordinary thing. <laughs>